The MiG-29 was meant to be the renaissance of Soviet fighter aviation. But after the ill-fated development process, lost air jewels, and the hard downfall of the MiG Bureau, it ended up being one of the worst fourth-gen fighters. However, after lengthy development, its successor finally became all that this jet needed to be, a multi-purpose fighter with an array of weaponry and electronics that suit a modern aircraft and can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with whatever the West throws at them. This is the MiG-35, or the story of how the last fulcrum finally took to the skies. It's the year 1985, and Russia is in chaos. The Russian spy bureau, the KGB, just found out that one of their top engineers has just leaked information to the West. One of the Phasertron chief engineers, Adolf Tokachev, has sold all the data about the radars for their magical Su-27, their phenomenal MiG-29, and even the S-300 to the CIA. All the hard work and secret development of this new fourth generation fighter were now in vain. The Americans could easily counter these brand new aircraft and the tick for tack Cold War was decidedly leaning towards an allied victory. So to get revenge and match the West, the MiG-29M program was started. Equipped with a completely new set of avionics, fly-by-wire commands which were present only in the Su-27 at this point, and the Zook radar, it was able to carry any air-to-air -air or air-to-ground piece of weaponry the USSR had at the time. Essentially, this was finally the true answer to the American F-16 that had so far outwitted the Soviets. On the 26th of April 1986, Valery Minitsky performed the first successful flight of the new jet, and they were celebrating this success as the step forward in the Soviet fighter program. Alas, the worst possible thing in the entire world could happen. The fourth reactor of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant exploded. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union, and the Soviets have admitted that it happened. Happened several days oh, ago. Yeah. It would take that long here. for radiation. The Chernobyl disaster shook the world, and most of all, the whole Soviet Union. An insane amount of money was poured into liquidation of this disaster and covering up the fourth reactor block with as many lives lost in the process. The Soviet economy, already in a bad condition, was turned upside down, and many military projects had to be stopped or paused for the time being. One of them was the MiG-29M. However, soon enough MiG saw an opportunity for retribution with another important project which still received funding from the government. A new carrier-borne fighter. Their main competitor, Sohoi, had the great idea to just modify the Su-27 airframe, slap on a new name, the Su-27KM or Su-33, and call it a day. MiG, not wanting to lose this contract, thought to do the same. They would just modify a great plane that they had on hand and accommodate it for the purposes of the Soviet Navy. Thus arrived the MiG-29K. A special ramp was built in Crimea to give the effect of a deck of an aircraft carrier, and testing was begun to simulate takeoffs and landings. The first flight from this fake deck was performed by a pilot called Aviad Fastovec, who, side note, is honestly just as fascinating. Not only was he a hero of the Soviet Union, distinguished test pilot, and even a test pilot for the space vehicle MiG-105, which is a future video, let me know in the comments if you want to see that, he had a very particular name. His father was a big aviation enthusiast and called his son, well, Jet Engine. I'm not even going to try and pronounce this, but this is how Jet Engine is written in Russian, and if you take the letters from all the words, you get, well, Aviad. Back to the story. After successfully testing on land in 1989, the MiG-29K then had its first landing on the deck of a new aircraft carrier called the Tbilisi at the time. 
However, even though the MiG-29K was, unlike the Su-33, a true multi-role fighter, there was an issue. Despite having great avionics and a smaller size that made it more optimised for carrier ops, there was a big problem. The range. You see, oceans are big and the government wanted a new aircraft with considerable range for carrier base operations, and the Su-33 was more than capable in terms of that requirement. So MiG-29 again lost a contract and MiG lost the battle. But the war for the future of the Russian Air Force was still to be won. But that battle would take place in a whole new country. Now, I bet you're watching this and wondering what would it be like to fly a modern Soviet fighter jet? Well, now you can in today's video sponsor, War Thunder. Now, don't fast forward the timeline because I'm actually inviting you to come and play with me and fly some of these crazy aircraft that have ever been built in War Thunder. It's a free online military vehicle combat game. It features over 2,000 different land, sea and air machines from 1920s all the way to just after the Cold War that you can fly, drive and cruise. My favourite so far has been the P-38E Lightning blowing enemy bombers out of the sky. And there are even updates every few months with more content, just like one that has released the Soviet MiG-29 which is the precursor to today's video. You can play solo missions, or my favorite, in huge air battles with over a hundred different maps. That's right, huge battles that we can actually all play together. We played last time and it was the most chaos that I've ever seen in a match. I'm still very much a beginner at the game, so you have a great chance to save me from other players, or if you really want, shoot me down, just like everybody else did last time. Plus, when you make an account with my link, you get a free bonus premium tank, aircraft and ship, as well as a boost to your account. The game's free to play across all platforms, PC, PlayStation and Xbox, and you can cross-play with anyone on any other device. So you don't need anything, just a keyboard and a mouse on the basic PC will run it. So there's no excuse not to make an account down below with my link, do the tutorial and come and play with me at the end of the month. It's going to be an absolute blast. The 90s were kind of terrible for the MiG-29. After a very bad performance in air battles all over the world, starting with Iraq where ill-equipped Iraqi MiGs stood no chance against F-15s, and then all the way to Yugoslavia where pilots were flying suicide missions without working radars. And then eventually in Ethiopia in 1998, where none other but flankers for the Ethiopian Air Force crushed the Eritrean MiG-29s. The MiG-29 was just not cut out for this future. But then, India came to the rescue. You see, the Indians wanted their own aircraft carrier and signed with the Russians to convert one of their Kiev-class carriers into a new ship for their navy, heavily modified it, and most important for our story, continued developing the MiG-29K and equipped them with said jet. The Indians were very happy with their MiG-29s and saw the potential of this jet to be converted for their carriers. And plus their new carrier would not be able to operate large jets like the Su-33, so the smaller MiG-29 was finally just right. And thus the new MiG-29K took to the skies in 2007. But why stop there? Along with the naval variant, MiG developed the M2, the successor to the prospective M variant, which would share almost all exterior elements with the K, apart from being able to land on carriers. This new revised MiG was completely a new airframe, so to speak. The wing area was enlarged, as well as the ailerons and flaps to allow for carrier-based takeoffs and landings. The nose section was also completely changed in a new, much larger cockpit and large canopy which would allow for much better visibility and situational awareness for the pilot was installed. And it was also equipped with the new Zook Mi Pisa radar fly-by-wire system which allowed for 8 instead of 6 weapon mounting points on the wings. So this new MiG was packing. The landing gear was also strengthened and new RD-33 MK engines which would allow the jet to fly double the flight hours from 2000 to 4000 which was one of the original issues with the original engines along with a total service life of the aircraft being brought up to 6000 flight hours. 
The Russian Navy decided to buy these jets too for their own aircraft carriers instead of further development of the Su-33. So the hero of the story, MiG, finally won the war against its rival, Sahoy. And in a victory lap, Algeria and Egypt also wanted their hands on this jet. The refueling pod was also added along with a novelty which would allow one jet flying with a couple of fuel tanks to act as a tanker to another MiG. You didn't even need any tanker aircraft. To sum it all up, the MiG-29 platform was finally what the F-16 became back in the 90s. But then, the MiG-35 arrived. The MMRCA was called the mother of all tenders. The Indian Air Force needed 120 new jets for their Air Force, and this was a multi-billion dollar contract, something that would give the MiG Bureau a complete rebirth. So they decided to roll up their sleeves and employ a little Sohoi grease to their project. They further modified the M2 variant and updated it with a Zook AE and finally an AESA radar. They integrated a targeting pod on the right engine gondola and the Russians even agreed to transfer this technology to the Indians for local manufacturing. But because this jet was completely based off the M2 and the differences, as mentioned, were not that spectacular, they decided that it had to be a marketing twist. They called this new jet the MiG-35. And this is the variant that the model that you're seeing today represents. It was cheap, easy, and a logical solution to the Indian problem. With pilots and ground crew already familiar with the platform, MiG was hoping that this would be an easy win. However, the competition was very strong. Rafael, Eurofighter, Super Hornet, Gripen, and even the F-16 were in the mix. And in the end, the Indians chose the Rafale. With Mirage already in service for many years and geopolitically speaking, a sort of neutral decision for them, Rafale was a superior jet and a good choice for the Indians. And these people didn't want to just rely on the Russians for all of their aircraft. Troubles with the maintenance, spare parts and transfer of technology had been plaguing the Navy MiG-29s throughout the years and only recently have they been solved. Although they were cheap, they came with a lot of caveats. The MiG Bureau was left hanging and with the completion of their current orders, they didn't have any new ones and the dark clouds formed once again on the horizon. By 2017, new MiG-35s were presented to the public and the Russian Air Force signed a deal for two squadrons of these jets. Unlike the ones designed for the MMRCA tender, instead of an integrated targeting pod called the OLSK, two additional mounting points were added to the engine gondolas and the MiG-35 was seen with T-220 targeting pods that had been used on the Su-30 and the Su-35 as well. But then this is where it gets a little bit confusing and if there's any uh, Russians that work for MiG watching this right now, I would love for this answer. It seems that the Russian version is running the older Zook M radar even though they're offering the AESA radar for export. While this is the case is not known, maybe they still need to further develop this radar and a foreign investor would solve the issue, or they simply wanted to be cheap and save the money wherever they could for their own air force. This serial production MiG-35 comes in two variants, the S version, which is a single seater, and the UB version, which is a two seater. Both share the exact same airframe. Just that in the single seater variant, the second seat and part of the cockpit is removed and an additional fuel tank is located there instead. This shared design feature makes production much simpler. Regardless, the MiG-35 is a capable jet and a perfect light multi-role aircraft compared to the bulky Sukhois. And that's exactly what the main selling point is. Just like the F-16, it could be a cheaper workhorse to carry a bunch of weaponry and perform any kind of mission. The combat range of both the M2 and 35 were extended by almost 50% compared to the based MiG-29 variants. But all of this might be a cloud of hot gas as only six aircraft have been delivered, with that contract with the Russian Air Force being downsized. In the end, there's a reason why they call this the last fulcrum. It may be because it's finally what it was envisioned to be from the start, a capable, light, multi-role fighter. 
but the future will show if there is any place for this jet in the skies, or was it all for nothing, and we really are watching the flight of the last fulcrum. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this one today. I went a little bit technical into the specifications of the jet, but I really feel like that as newcomers to the channel, a lot of you may enjoy this quite a lot. So let me know down in the comments what you think, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.